Nevada receives just nine and a half inches of rainfall per year, making it the driest state in America, and 90% of its water comes from a single source that's been disappearing for two decades. What's being proposed to solve this crisis ranges from $100 billion pipelines to underwater aqueducts stretching over a thousand miles. And some of these projects aren't just concepts on paper because they're moving through government approval processes right now. Let's start with why Nevada ended up in this position. When Western states carved up the Colorado River in 1922, Nevada drew the short straw. That November in Santa Fe, negotiators signed the Colorado River Compact and gave Nevada just 300,000 acre-feet of water per year. California walked away with 4.4 million acre-feet, and Arizona secured 2.8 million. Nevada's share amounts to a mere 2% of the total allocation, which remains the smallest of any basin state by a wide margin. Back then, this allocation seemed reasonable enough. Nevada was sparsely populated, mostly desert, and Las Vegas amounted to little more than a small railroad town. Nobody anticipated what would come next. Fast forward to today, and Nevada's population has ballooned to 3.28 million people. Clark County alone, which encompasses the Las Vegas metropolitan area, holds 2.4 million residents, and that accounts for nearly 73% of the entire state. All these people depend on that same tiny allocation from a river that keeps shrinking year after year. Lake Mead delivers the water, and it stands as the largest reservoir in the United States after Hoover Dam's completion in 1935. At full capacity, the reservoir holds nearly 9 trillion gallons and sits at an elevation of 1,229 feet above sea level. July of 1983 marked its all-time high at 1,225 feet. And then came the drought. Around the year 2000, the Colorado River Basin entered what scientists now recognize as a mega drought, one of the worst dry periods in over a thousand years. Lake Mead started dropping, and it hasn't stopped since. Over 160 feet, that's how far the reservoir has fallen from its peak. On July 28, 2022, Lake Mead bottomed out at 1,040.58 feet, the lowest level since the reservoir began filling in 1937. Today, it hovers at roughly 31 to 33 percent capacity. August of 2021 brought a historic announcement when the Bureau of Reclamation declared the first ever Colorado River shortage. Mandatory cuts to Nevada's already meager allocation followed immediately, and the state now receives 7 percent less than its legal entitlement. Here's where it gets worse. The Colorado River Compact rested on bad math from the very beginning. Negotiators in 1922 estimated annual river flow at 16.4 million acre-feet, but tree ring studies later revealed the long-term average sat between 13.2 and 14.3 million acre-feet. Officials had measured during an unusually wet period, which meant the river was over-allocated before the first drop ever got diverted. What's Nevada doing about this existential threat to its water supply? Before we get into bringing Pacific water to Nevada, something remarkable has already happened in Las Vegas that deserves attention. 38 billion gallons less water in 2024 than in 2002. That's what Las Vegas used despite adding more than 800,000 new residents over that same period. The city grew dramatically, while its water consumption actually shrank. Residents in 1990 consumed roughly 350 gallons per person per day. By 2024, that figure had dropped below 220 gallons, which represents a 55% reduction in per capita water use over three decades. The methods behind this transformation span everything from regulation to engineering ingenuity. Nevada banned new golf courses from using Colorado River water and capped new residential pools at 600 square feet. Starting in 2027, irrigation of decorative grass will be prohibited entirely. But here's the really clever part. Nearly 100% of indoor water used in Las Vegas gets captured, treated, and returned to Lake Mead through a 12-mile natural filtration channel called the Las Vegas Wash. Every gallon returned means Nevada can withdraw another gallon. And in 2019, Las Vegas diverted 490,000 acre-feet while only consuming 234,000, sending 256,000 acre-feet back to Lake Mead. This system stretches Nevada's allocation far beyond what the law technically allows. 
Conservation has limits, though, and Nevada is approaching what water managers call an efficiency ceiling. Eventually, new supplies will become necessary. The Pacific Ocean sits roughly 270 miles from Las Vegas in a straight line, and it represents the largest body of water on Earth. Several proposals have emerged to tap this virtually unlimited water source. Around 2019, a concept nicknamed the Little Pacific Project surfaced from R.B. Provencher, a former U.S. Department of Energy manager. His proposal called for a 170-mile pipeline from the Pacific Ocean to create an artificial basin in Nevada spanning approximately 75 miles long and 1,000 feet deep, with a second 120-mile pipeline transporting water to Lake Mead for desalination. This proposal remains purely conceptual, with no engineering studies conducted and no government endorsement. A more serious effort materialized in May of 2022 when Utah's Legislative Water Development Commission authorized a feasibility study for a pipeline from the Pacific Ocean to the Great Salt Lake. The proposed route would stretch six to 700 miles from the California coast, across the Sierra Nevada mountains, through Nevada's deserts, and into Utah. When asked if this was realistic, Representative Joel Ferry didn't hesitate. Oh no, we're dead serious about this. I mean, desperate times call for desperate measures, and all options are on the table. Senator David Hinkins put it more simply, There's a lot of water in the ocean, and we have very little in the Great Salt Lake. November of 2023 brought the most ambitious private proposal yet, when a Nevada-based company called Western Water Project submitted plans to Arizona's Water Infrastructure Finance Authority. 1,100 miles of undersea pipeline from the mouth of the Columbia River at the Oregon-Washington border plus 530 miles of overland infrastructure. That's what this project envisions. The goal would deliver 10 million acre-feet of water annually to California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and New Mexico, capturing 5 to 10 percent of the Columbia River's total discharge. The price tag sits at $125 billion. Western Water Project has requested $25 million for initial feasibility studies, and if built, water would cost approximately $1,573 per acre foot. Understanding whether these numbers make sense requires looking at what America has already accomplished. A century of audacious water infrastructure in the American West proves that projects once considered impossible can become reality. 242 miles from Lake Havasu to Southern California, that's the reach of the Colorado River Aqueduct completed in 1941. It delivers 800,000 acre-feet annually and features 92 miles of tunnels, along with five pumping stations. The American Society of Civil Engineers named it one of the seven modern civil engineering wonders in 1955, and its cost in 1930s dollars amounted to $220 million, which translates to roughly $4 to $5 billion today. The California State Water Project proved even more impressive when it began delivering water in 1973. Its 444-mile California aqueduct lifts water 2,882 feet over the Tehachapi Mountains, and the Edmonston Pumping Plant achieves a single lift of 1,926 feet, the highest anywhere in the world. Arizona completed its own Central Arizona project in 1993, lifting water 2,900 feet over 336 miles. Americans can move water at continental scales. These projects prove that much. Whether a Pacific to Nevada pipeline makes economic sense is the real question. This is where the challenges become hard to ignore. Between $2,000 and $3,000 per acre foot, that's what desalinated seawater costs today. Colorado River water runs between $300 and $855 per acre foot, which makes ocean water roughly 7 to 10 times more expensive. San Diego's Carlsbad desalination plant opened in December 2015 at a cost of about $1 billion and produces water at approximately $2,750 per acre foot. By 2026, that price is projected to climb to $3,736. One Las Vegas Review Journal reader ran the numbers and calculated that replicating Carlsbad's output for Las Vegas would require 10 such facilities running at full capacity. And that doesn't account for the extremely high pipeline and pumping costs needed to lift water over the Sierra Nevada. Environmental challenges compound the economic ones. 
Every liter of fresh water from desalination generates approximately one and a half liters of toxic brine requiring disposal. And the California State Water Resources Control Board estimates that open ocean intakes used by coastal facilities kill billions of marine organisms annually. May of 2022 brought a decisive moment when the California Coastal Commission unanimously rejected a proposed desalination plant at Huntington Beach, voting 11-0 after more than 20 years of review. Commissioner Dana Bocco stated simply, The ocean is under attack. Given these obstacles, the Southern Nevada Water Authority has pursued something more pragmatic than building a 300-mile pipeline over mountains. Strategic Partnerships The concept works like this. Nevada invests in desalination facilities along the California or Mexican coast. Those facilities use desalinated ocean water instead of drawing from the Colorado River, and the freed-up river water becomes available to Nevada through exchange agreements. SNWA General Manager John Ensminer laid out the strategy in 2018. If I got my crystal ball out, I believe that in 30, 40 years from now, Southern Nevada probably will have an equity interest in a desalination facility either on the coast of California or on the Pacific coast of Mexico. Nevada is already moving in this direction, with a signed letter of intent to invest up to $700 million in a $3 billion water recycling project with the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. The exchange would give Nevada 25 to 30 percent of recycled water credits, adding approximately 25,000 acre-feet to Southern Nevada's annual supply. SNWA has also accumulated over 2.2 million acre-feet of water credits in storage agreements across multiple states, which equals 11 to 12 years of current consumption. And in 2020, Nevada completed a $1.5 billion insurance policy called the Low Lake Level Pumping Station. This facility features 34 submersible pumps and a third intake tunnel, allowing Las Vegas to draw water from Lake Mead even if the reservoir drops below the point where water can flow through Hoover Dam. Las Vegas can access water at virtually any lake level, even approaching what engineers call Deadpool. One more piece of history deserves mention. A project so ambitious it makes everything we've discussed look modest by comparison. March of 1964 saw the Ralph M. Parsons Company of Los Angeles unveil NAWAPE, the North American Water and Power Alliance. This plan would have diverted water from Alaska and Canada's Yukon, Fraser, and Columbia Rivers southward through a 500-mile reservoir in British Columbia's Rocky Mountain Trench, delivering 120 million acre-feet annually while generating 70 million kilowatts of power. $80 billion in 1960s money, that was the estimated cost, which translates to $800 billion or more today. Newsweek called it the most colossal, stupendous, super-splendificent public works project in history. Nawapa never got built. Canadian General Andrew McNaughton called it a monstrous proposal. In 1966, environmental opposition mounted, and the cost proved staggering even by Cold War standards. But the project keeps resurfacing periodically, and water experts have started calling it a zombie project because it refuses to die completely. The underlying problem it was meant to solve just keeps getting worse. Current Colorado River operating guidelines expire in 2026, and contentious renegotiations are already underway. Upper Basin and Lower Basin states have submitted competing proposals to the Bureau of Reclamation, and the outcome remains uncertain. Pat Mulroy, who ran Southern Nevada's water strategy for 25 years as SNWA general manager, has expressed concern about the process. Political posturing makes me very concerned that we're not going to be able to craft a durable solution. But she remains an advocate for bold action. There is no such thing as a water project that doesn't have a constituent of opponents. The first thing they'll lob at you is how expensive it is. So it's okay to spend billions to lease water from farmers and cut down on the food supply. But it's not okay to spend billions to build a project to add water to the system. Federal funding is becoming available through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law which allocated $250 million specifically for ocean and brackish water desalination projects in western states, along with $550 million for water reuse. June of 2024 brought an additional $700 million boost for Nevada and western states to fund water conservation, including desalination and recycling projects. Is America actually redirecting the Pacific Ocean into Nevada? 
Not exactly, at least not yet. No approved mega project exists today, but the concept isn't science fiction either. The engineering is technically feasible, and precedent projects show that Americans can move water at continental scales. The water crisis is undeniably real. What makes Nevada's situation unique is the strategic approach it has pioneered. Rather than attempting to build an impractical pipeline over the Sierra Nevada, Nevada is positioning itself to essentially lease Pacific Ocean water through investment partnerships. Financing California or Mexico desalination could secure additional Colorado River allocation for Nevada without laying a single mile of new pipeline to the coast. The timeline stretches decades into the future, with SNWA leadership projecting 30 to 40 years before Nevada likely holds an equity stake in coastal desalination. Whether Pacific water ultimately reaches Nevada through direct pipeline, water exchange, or some technology we haven't yet imagined remains one of the great unsettled questions of American infrastructure. One thing is certain, though. The driest state in America is planning for a future where the largest ocean on Earth becomes part of its water supply.